you, you premiered it earlier this year at Sundance, and it premieres on HBO on the 26th of October. Um, so yes. everyone will be able to share and and how beautiful this this film is. But how did you initially get involved in it? Well, the producer Barry Perlman and I had worked together on a project some years previously, um, another documentary project that we shot in Alaska, actually. And we had a great time working together and wanted to do it again. And when she um, connected with Alexandra Shiva, the director, she recommended me, and we all was all we all felt like it was a great fit. So that's how I got involved. When when you're working the documentary form as you've done quite a bit in your career, it it must seem like a kind of a completely new adventure each time out because there's such a diverse range of su- of subjects that you're called upon to explore in the documentary field. So so when you heard the the subject of this film that you were going to capture the lives of uh, of a group of kids uh, that that uh, are varying degrees of of autistic preparing for a school dance what was the uh, how did you familiarize yourself with that world prior to shooting well it was it presented a number of challenges for us both from a cinematography standpoint from a production standpoint from a sound standpoint um and Alex, the director, was very good about sending us a lot of information about the subject and her research and her experience with it from the beginning. And then when we went to Columbus, um, we we took a strategy of presenting ourselves and what we were going to do to the people we were going to film in a way that I haven't done on another film before. But it, was, it had very much to do with Alexandra's understanding of what these kids and young adults on the autism spectrum um, might need from us. And that was, we met with every single one of our potential film subjects. Uh, as a, They're usually in a group of about four or five. Um, the director, the producer, me, and the sound man, Josh Isaac. Um, and basically described exactly what we would be doing, both literally with the equipment, I mean, showing them the camera, showing them the sound equipment, demonstrating how we would be moving with it, you know, what it looks like, allowing them if they wanted to to touch the boom, you know, which everyone wants to do. Um, but just making it very real and very accessible and very open to them so that they could ask us questions if they had any fears or any concerns. And they did. They had lots of questions. Um, so I think then when we started actually filming with a group of people who are very sensitive to external stimuli potentially or just being distracted by unusual things, they were already sort of acclimatized to us, and we kind of were to them, too, in a way. We'd all met. We'd all gotten to know each other a little bit. So it made, I think, our sort of initial intro into this community much, much smoother for all of us, and I think allowed them to let us into their world in a way they might not have. So after a while, <clears throat> your your team just became a extension of their natural environment in a way? Well, I, I, you know, you hope so. I don't know that that's really what happened, but they certainly um, let us par- participate in their therapy sessions and let us come to their homes. And they also, I think, had a real understanding that they could, if they wanted to, at any time, tell us to stop. If they just, if it was too much, if they were overwhelmed or whatever they were feeling. And one of the Meredith, one of the three girls in the film, um, she did. She would just say when she was when she had enough, she would just say, "You can go now." And that would be it. I would look at Alex, and she would look at me, and be like, okay, so we're done. <laughs> Time to move on. <laughs> and she did it a couple uh, times. <laughs> you, you know, it's such a valuable point. I mean, it's especially relevant for, for, for this particular subject matter in this film, but I would think as a as a documentary filmmaker – that uh, that's a concern you have to have every time out be- to to create an environment in which your subjects can feel as as natural as possible. Because if you stick a camera on most people, they're going to tense up. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Although people have become more and more sort of used to the idea of cameras around, especially now that everyone's using their phones as cameras all the mm-hmm. time. Um, but I. I think um, it is always a concern. It's always a concern for me as the one with the camera, and it's part of my job to become invisible 
um, and unthreatening and uh, just another part of the environment in a way. Um, so I felt like this was a really successful maneuver that we did or a strategy, and I feel like it's something that um, I would like to use on many films of just introducing myself and the gear and everything to the people I'm going to film because I think it, it goes a long way. What what really delights me most about the documentary form is just the sense of discovery when you really feel the spontaneity of life kind of unfurling in front of you. And I'm wondering in the you know, you could you could go into a project and you could have in mind a certain a certain narrative that you're going for, but uh, on a documentary that could that could uh, morph into something completely different by, in the end. And I'm wondering in this process of making How to Dance in Ohio, uh, what's what su- surprised you most about the lives that you were capturing? Um, I think, well, part of it was sort of the arc of the film. The, we didn't know going into it how successful this whole dance project was going to be. Um, I mean, we knew that it was a great idea and a great concept, but we didn't know how how well these um, characters would actually embrace it themselves. So um, that was sort of watching them kind of flower and open up as as the process went along and watching them really rise to the occasion um, was was really impressive and moving and fun for all of us, I think. Yeah. Did you make a uh, swim team before or after this? Before. Yeah. Before. That, okay. Yeah, that that Oh, swim team. I'm sorry. I was thinking of a different film. Swim team actually was the year after. Yeah. It's they're still editing right now actually. Okay. And and was was the experience you had because if I'm not mistaken the uh the subject of that is is similar uh in terms of just the the the, the autism spectrum it's it's another exploration of of that kind of community. Is it, it is. It's it is. It's about a uh, a team in New Jersey called the Jersey Hammerheads that is entirely made up of of kids on the autism spectrum. I think there were 13 or 14 kids when we were filming all together on the team. And um it's it's it had takes a different tack and I don't mm-hmm. want to talk too much about it because they're forming it now <laughs> from what we did. But um it's it's again uh, an exploration of something that I think is really needs to be opened up to the wider world because there are now so many of these children um and they're growing up and you know, it's like what happens as they become adults and enter into society in a more independent or not way. I feel like we all need to come to grips with that on some level. When you're, this might sound like a really kind of highfalutin question, but but, uh, (laughs) when when you're entering these different worlds as you you have throughout your career and and you're witnessing people kind of dealing with their and overcoming their own kind of challenges in life, does it? Do you feel like it enriches? Uh, does it enrich your own life and your own experience going through this with them? Absolutely. I mean, it's part of what I love about what I do. Um, each each project, each film, I learn a whole new kind of language of a new sort of culture, community, subculture, or community, or group of passionate people who are you know enthusiastic about some particular thing, which is what we're documenting. And um, that's just incredibly uh, exciting. It just opens up worlds to me that I didn't know about, maybe didn't even think were were out there until the director introduced me to the subject. Um, Mm -hmm. But it's, it, you just you don't know what's coming next, and you have to be ready for that unknown at, at every moment. And it's very it's intimate and exciting and just fun. I I just love it. Yeah. So what was the uh, what was the kind of inspiration for you to get into cinematography in the first place? Why did that feel like the the perfect fit for you? Um. Well, I I had done some still photography when I was in school. And I'd done a lot of writing um, as a young person. (laughs) And I sort of put those two things together and originally thought of film editing um, and just storytelling in general, but more specifically editing. And I I explored that a little bit at a place called the International um, Film and Television Workshops up in Maine, which is where I'm from. 
and realized I didn't really want to sit in a dark room in front of a monitor all day. I wanted to be out with the camera um, um, in the field. So that sort of pushed me in the direction of uh, cinematography, and I moved to New York and started working as a camera assistant and worked my way up. Was Along the way, was there kind of a, a, a mentor or a series of mentors that you had? Yeah, there there were. I mean, I would say that my um, probably the one who had most influence and impact on my life is a DP named Richard Rakowski, who I was the first person to hire me as a camera assistant when I moved to New York, and I've worked with. <clears throat> excuse me, I've worked with throughout the years, um, both when we were both assistants, and then when he became a DP, and then I followed in, in his footsteps. Um, and I think he's an incredibly talented and, and you know an influential person, and, and uh, had a real impact on my career. But when you observe people like that, uh, as you're kind of forming your your own identity as a as a camera person, um, what kind of not necessarily technical tricks, but um, just their their whole manner of of working and their approach to the work. What what did you observe in them that was most valuable to you? Um, I think part of it was his sort of demeanor on set, his sort of calmness in the face of any problem. Um, his just very sort of controlled and rational approach to solving whatever came his way was was what I learned from Richard um, and from other other people that I work with that I thought were really good at their jobs. Um, and I think. Especially in documentary, that's really the approach you need to take because you you just so don't know what's coming next, and you just yeah. have to be able to ride with it and and keep going and turn on whatever dime you're presented with. Um, so that was that was a real lesson to me um, about how to how to approach each problem as it comes along. Is there when when you work on narrative? Uh, films as you have and and you've done t- TV work as well um is it does it feel like a complete departure from the documentary form or do they share more similarities than differences they're pretty different <laughs> i mean they're uh, i guess um, i mean it's one thing to have a, a a large crew and be directing a lot of people at one time versus the very intimate and and um small uh, working unit of a documentary, um, and with narrative, it's it's so much about you're starting from from zero. You're creating everything from scratch, and you're not. I mean, again, you have to deal with locations and environments, and so there's always parameters. And the more parameters, the better, in my opinion, because often, if you can do anything you want, you don't know what to do. Um, so, I guess. They're kind of they're they're different orientations. They're different mindsets, um, and I feel like, I guess, what I really love about documentary is that intimacy and that. Um, and I have a lot in many ways as a cinematographer. You actually have a great deal more control in documentary because your hands are on the camera, and you're the one making a split second decision on what to focus on, where to turn it, you know, who to. I mean, if you have good communication with your director and you understand each other, and then hopefully you're making the decisions that they would want, and you can even you know, have ways of communicating in the environment sometimes. But still, you as a DP have a great deal more uh, creative control in that moment than you often do on a narrative set where there's so many other um, people involved and, and scripts and you know, things that determine exactly what you're going to do long before you do it. And, and plus, on a documentary, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. It, it must be that you, you there's there ne- is never a time when you're kind of when you're off. I, it feels like you always have to be present because you don't know when a magic moment will occur. That's very true. Um, it's it's a real balance to walk, just as a human being. <laughs> trying not to overwork yourself and yet be prepared to film at a moment's notice. And uh, you end up with a lot of interrupted meals sometimes, which is not always the best thing. But, um, but yeah, you do, you do really have to be, I mean, present is a good word, um, and sometimes just really alert. And a lot of it's about listening even more than looking, um, which is why I always wear headphones and I always, or hopefully not while I'm eating my meal, but um, certainly while I'm holding the camera so that I, I can hear because often, you know, if you're working with a great sound person, 
they will see stories developing. They will hear things that, that either you can't see because it's happening behind you or you just don't hear because you're not paying attention. Um, so to that particular moment. So they can direct the mic over there and, you know, it gives you a, a impetus to, to swing the camera over in that direction because something's developing that you didn't even know about. So listening is just as important as, as, as your eyes, in my opinion. Well, I, I, also, with I mean, if you think years ago when uh, the majority of documentaries were shot uh, on film, um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> which I would imagine is very rare today, uh, it, does the does the digital technology does it? Uh, I mean, just by its very nature, I guess it allows you to be a lot more mobile and 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 fluid with with your accessibility to capturing those moments. Um, yes, although I mean, I guess it depends on what you're using because some of these digital cameras have a lot more contraptions going on than film cameras ever did, and that mm. that can be a, a hindrance to some extent, but. Um, I guess, I mean, it certainly allows you, and this is both a plus and a minus, it allows you more freedom to just roll when you need to, although I feel like that's become, that often can be taken advantage of in a negative way because people don't know when to stop or they don't know how to somewhat edit in their heads as they go because they have this sort of endless supply of storage space versus the expense of film back when people were using film, which was a sort of automatic editing device. Um, because you, you know you only had so many rolls of film with you, and that's what you had, and you had to work within those parameters. Um, it certainly, uh, I think, allows a lot of experimentation and with both things how look and how they, um, uh, with you know the ability to see into low light, things like that, allow you to go into places that would have been much harder when we we're shooting on film. Um, yeah. But I, I always feel like, you know, the, it's just about what is the right tool for the project you're doing. So it might, it's you're right, it's rare these days that it's film, but it does still happen that people do shoot documentaries on film if it if it works for what they're doing. I I got to tell you, I love uh, American Teen. I, I remember watching that at a, oh, a festival. You. A festival whenever it was uh, making the festival rounds, and I just fell in love with it. It was such a revelation oh, to me. It was there. There were there were a team of what th- three uh, cinematographers on that project, including yourself. Well, not all at once. Um, I was there for most of the time, and then the times I couldn't be there, Wolfgang held and Robert Hanna, and there were a couple of other people who filled in also. Um, but it was the single camera. Well, mostly single camera um, for some of the big events like the prom or uh, the battle of the mm-hmm. bands. Um, we had multiple cameras going on and brought in other people. But the the we shot um, a thousand hours of footage on that film, and it, almost all of it was one camera at a time. Wow! Wow! Yeah. Yeah, I didn't I didn't know if if each camera person was responsible for one particular story thread or or not. I didn't know. No, it was it was one person there, you know, flitting around from story to story. Um, because we were there for a long time, so we were able to cover a lot of different events. We had we had the time to spend a day with one character, or a day with another, and you know, sort of spread mm. it out. When you're, I, I'm sure that do, do you when you show at festivals and such, when you do you attend, try to make it a point to attend any festival that you're you're able to to see your work in front of an audience and see how it works. I'm not really able to do that much. I've I've, I've done it for a couple of films i try to go to you know, i try to go to all the premieres and be there for the first one but usually the subsequent ones i don't necessarily make it to um but it is really fun to be there with an audience and and i also i mean i don't necessarily ha- i uh, see the films that many times before i see it in the color correct but i don't yeah. i'm not usually there for a lot of the edit process although every director is slightly different in how they approach it so i've had some directors who brought me in for rounds of rough cuts to give feedback and that kind of thing but um, it doesn't always happen, and I can't always go because I'm shooting something else. So, um, so I guess my point was that the premiere may be only the second time or third time that I've seen the whole film at all. So it's mm. um, it's fun, and and it's uh, it's not like I'm bored with the film yet, <laughs> which hopefully <laughs> I never am. But 
Well, this this did show at Sundance, correct? How to Dance in, in Ohio? Yes. Yes, it did. It premiered and, there last and, January. And that's as big a form as you could get. Uh, did you attend that one? I did, and um, I was there for, I think, three of the five screenings, and it was fantastic. The audiences were incredibly enthusiastic and warm and responsive to the film, so it was it made us feel terrific. <laughs> and also, um, all three of the girls and their families were there, and Dr. Amigo and uh, his daughter. So we had something like 17 members of the film <laughs> roaming around with us at all the events and at all the premieres, um, which was really fun. And they they had all seen the film before um, Alex had brought it to Columbus to show to them before it went to Sundance. And they all expressed that it felt, I mean, it was incredibly gratifying to hear this, that it felt true to them and they were happy with it. I can imagine that, I mean, I hear actors and filmmakers um, f- from the narrative world, a lot of times they talk about, you know, you're you're so close uh, for a period of three to six months, and then you kind of disband, and you don't really see one another again, and it feels like a great loss, but that's the nature of what you do. Uh, but in documentary form, when you're when you're so intimately immersed in the world of these subjects, it it must feel like a like a loss or a sadness, melancholy when it all comes to a close. It does, um, and it's that you know it is really. Uh, I don't know what the word is. I mean, it's just. I mean, it's fun and it's it's uh, um, nourishing, kind of, to reconnect to these people after the film is done and we all get together and celebrate it. But yeah, I mean, not everyone welcomes you in as much, maybe as as the people in and How to Dance in Ohio did. Um, mm-hmm. But you still you get to, you do get to know them and they they become part of they become part of my life as much as I'm part of theirs for this short period of time. So. Yeah, it is. It is kind of a. I mean, I guess when it, when it's over, there is that sort of sense of well, we will see each other because this film's going to be finished and it's going to festivals. <laughs> so you have yeah. that sort of hope that you'll reconnect, but you don't always. You don't. And you don't always know how it's going to go. So. Yeah, my last question for you. It's it's what I ask all the cinematographers I talk to. Uh, mm-hmm. If you were to teach a class on cinematography. And you were to pull, you know, three to five examples of works throughout the history of film, whether it be documentary, narrative, or what have you, to teach a particular lesson. Uh, what would, which clips would you choose, or films would you choose? Do you think? Um, I think my first choice would be a film that was. I think it's the only film he directed um, it's by Gary Oldman. It's called Nil by Mouth, mm. and it was shot by Ron Fortunato. It's one of my favorite films, and it's all shot uh, very long lens and very. It feels very documentary-like, which is probably why I like it so much. Um, so you really feel like you're there and you're part of, of what is a very sort of. It's a very. It's a difficult film. It's not an easy film. Um, very emotional and gripping kind of subjects, um, but he manages to bring you right into it and make you feel like you're part of it. And some of it's kind of scary, and some of it's just sad, and some of it's just depressing. And then parts of it are you know, people connecting and, and having these emotional moments. Um, and it's a really, I just one of them. It's my one of my favorite, most effective pieces of filmmaking. And I would, I would, I would show that in a heartbeat. It's a, it's a sensational movie, and it uh, and it gave us or it introduced me to Ray Winstone, which was itself yes. a gift. <laughs> yes, exactly.